Grace and peace, you're listening to United We Pray. Taking racial struggles to the throne of grace, United We Pray is a ministry devoted to prayer about racial strife, especially between Christians. We want to help Christians pray and think about race in ways that are biblical and helpful, clear and hopeful. You can learn more about our work at uwepray.com. That's U-W-E-P-R-A-Y.com, where you can find articles, previous episodes, and more. Welcome back, friends, to Unite We Pray. As with last week's episode, this week features Matt Martins again, this time in a Q&A format after his lecture from last week. If you haven't listened to the last two episodes, I'd encourage you to do that before listening to this one. But as always, hope you're encouraged to think about these things and pray. There's some heavy stuff in these recent episodes, and uh, in one sense, we're sorry about that, but we hope that it helps you think well about the world we live in and how we can pray to improve it. Uh, So thanks as always for listening. Grace and peace. Matt, thank you so much for that. You're about to make me cry there at the end of the talk. Um, Thank you so much for doing this. Friends, a couple notes for our time here as we move into time of Q&A. I'm still getting questions. So if you have one and you haven't submitted it, go ahead. I'll see it. Uh, Not promising we can get to all of them, uh, but I see some good ones in here. Second, if you can't see us, feel free to move. We we had to pick a side of the uh, podium, so you're not being distracting if you want to scoot around to the other side. Lastly, this Slido link, as Isaac mentioned at the beginning, that has uh, some other links in it. So even if you don't want to ask a question, I would encourage you to check that one out. There's links to pre-order Matt's book, links for more information on United We Pray, uh, and other good stuff. So moving What do you on. got? Oh, I got a bunch, Matt. Um, but I wanted to ask you one from the jump, because I can do that, which is I wanted to t- ask you about the Flowers case. Yeah. And... I hear people all the time talk about how racial disparities, bad laws, things like that are a thing of the past. And I think the assumption is, as soon as the bad law is fixed, everything is better. That's clearly not the case, right? Do we see that in other areas of the criminal justice system? The U.S. Constitution was amended in the wake of the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were meant to outlaw slavery, to guarantee equal protection of the laws, to guarantee that you won't be denied the right to vote on the basis of race. And we know as a fact that while those things were, den- were outlawed in 1865, we know that they were still occurring in 1965. I mean, just to take the example of the 15th Amendment, prohibiting the exclusion of voters on the basis of race. That didn't become against the law in 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. That became against the law in 18. 18- 68 or 71 with the adoption of the 15th Amendment. And similarly, the outlawing of selecting jurors on the basis of race or applying criminal law on the basis of race was outlawed with the Reconstruction Amendments in the 1800s. And yet you can read case after case from the Supreme Court. I just used one example, 1986, where the Supreme Court, and not until 1986, outlaws the use of says what these prosecutors are doing violates the Constitution. It's not that it became illegal in 1986. It was illegal. They just said this latest and greatest method that prosecutors were using was unconstitutional. And so, but then, you, but then even then, so we're in 1986, 120 years after Reconstruction or after the Civil War, and yet we're seeing in 2019, prosecutors are just inventing new ways to evade the rules. So, Yes, the law is part of achieving justice, the, imp- the adoption of the law, but the implementation of the law is also part of achieving justice. And there's a resistance to, uh, the law doesn't automatically change hearts. It does make things illegal, but people who are intent on continuing in that behavior will find ways to evade it. So that ongoing implementation is as much a reason as any to dig in. That's not a reason yeah. to sit back. No, not at all. And in fact, I think that one of the I mean, I know you and I have talked about this before, but you probably have all heard of things like qualified immunity, which give police uh, immunity from federal civil rights suits for violating your constitutional rights. Qualified immunity leaves, at least leaves open a glimmer of possibility that police can be prosecuted if they violate your constitutional rights intentionally. Prosecutors have absolute immunity. There's no, there's no exception clause. A prosecutor could intentionally strike jurors on the basis of race and he or she cannot be sued civilly for a wrongful conviction that results from it. Yeah, that's crazy. So, so you want to know why implementation 
doesn't happen just because the law changes, because the, the law that would provide an enforcement mechanism like civil liability under federal civil rights suits has been, in, has been interpreted to have an exception that gives prosecutors total immunity from responsibility for violating your constitutional rights. So, I mean, I often hear when you see these exoneration cases, people say they should sue the prosecutor. They can't sue the prosecutor. Not under the federal civil rights statute. The prosecutor is totally immune from, law, from federal civil rights lawsuits. Well, we could dwell on that for a while. Let's move on to these questions here. We'll start with an easy one. How do you define justice? So, so I define justice the way Augustine define justice because Augustine is always a good answer to anything. Uh, he's smarter than me and people have adopted his view. So Augustine defines justice as giving to every man his due. Giving to every man, to every man, his due, what he's owed. And what we know from scripture is that what people are owed is our love. That was a revolutionary discovery for me, because I tended to think of loving others as my generosity. Like, I was being good to you. You didn't really deserve it. So if I loved you, I was giving you something you weren't entitled to. But that's not what Scripture says. Paul in Romans 13 says, no, owe, no man every, owe no man anything except to love. We have an obligation to love. You, as a fellow human being, ha are entitled to my love. You are due my love. You are owed my love. It's not something I dispense or don't dispense at my discretion. I mean, I may, but you are entitled to it. And so if, if justice is defined by Augustine as giving to every man is due, then, uh, and people are due our love, then justice is giving to everyone our love. And what it means to love is to will, again, the Christian definition of loving is to will and seek the good of another. So justice is to give to everyone what they are due, my love, which is my effort to will and seek their good. Next question is related. How do we love criminals and victims at the same time? So that's, that's what I was trying to get at with the idea of accuracy, right? We, we love the victim by rendering an accurate verdict, and we love the perpetrator by rendering, rendering an accurate verdict. We love victims by rendering an accurate verdict that... Uh, that deters, that protects society, that, that holds people accountable for the wrongs they've done. And yet at the same time, that's loving to the perpetrator because it is, is God's method of disciplining them ultimately to bring them to repentance. And so it's not, it's not intention, it's not unloving to punish someone. It's unloving to punish someone for a reason other than willing and seeking their best. Right? If I'm punishing someone because I want you to hurt because I hurt, that's not loving, and thus that's not God's justice. But if I punish you because I want you to repent, I want you to turn around, I want you back, that is both loving the victim because I'm holding accountable the person who did them wrong, and yet I'm administering the punishment not just to inflict pain, but to inflict change. Got it. Makes sense. Uh, this next question is, is more procedural. What's the result of a non-unanimous jury? So a non-unanimous jury is what's called a mistrial, hung jury, uh, and you do it again. Start over with a new jury. Uh, clarification question. Did you mean to say that the race of the criminal, not the victim, determines death sentence? No, I did not. Okay. That the data shows that the race of the victim is what drives the death sentence. So let me put a finer point on that. We have made a statement and as a nation, we make a statement through the administration of our death penalty that white lives matter more, that you are more likely to be sentenced to death for killing a white person than a black person. I'll just give a couple examples of this. In 1991, September of 1991, Pee -wee Herman, or Herman Pee Wee Gaskins was executed in the state of South Carolina, a white man, for killing a black person. That was the first time in since 1944, 1,700 intervening executions since a white man had been executed in the United States for killing a black man. 1944 to 1991, 1,700 executions, not a single one of a white man for killing a black man. That's that, what the evidence shows, the, the, 
no one seriously disputes the findings of the Baldus study, not the dissent in the Supreme Court case where it was reviewed, not the majority, not the dissent. Everyone accepted that the evidence showed to a statistical certainty that the race of the victim drives the administration of the death penalty. How can a system dispense proportional justice when people get killed before they can even get to trial? So it can't. And I think that that's where I think it's important as Christians to recognize that the, the justice we can achieve in this world is intermediate, it is temporary, it is provisional, but there will be ultimate justice. And so while we could lose hope at the instances, whether caused by that circumstance or others where we can't achieve justice, we, we can hope and, and, and have confidence. By hope, I mean we can have confidence as Christians that God will set all wrongs right. He will make all things. Well, I, I like that question because I hear some version of it all the time stated as an objection. Well, if they didn't want to get killed, they shouldn't have been doing X. Mm -hmm. How can we better talk about those situations in ways that reflect proportionality? Are you talking about the victim shouldn't have been doing X? Yes. Someone, someone is killed in a police interaction and people rush to justify the police because of some other infraction. He shouldn't have been selling loose cigarettes. Yeah. So, I mean, these are, yes, I mean, yeah, selling Eric Garner, right? So, you know, what you're raising is a, a Another question, which I touch on in my book, but is the question of policing. So all of this comes back to this question for us as Christians. What authority do you have to, to punish, or more precisely, to use physically coercive force against other people? So you have to understand the criminal justice system is the administration of coercive physical force against other people. It's, it's the use of violence against other people. No one goes to jail without actual or threatened physically coercive violence, right? Either you go in the cell or we're stuffing you in. Either you submit to the command to stop fleeing or we will shoot you. Either you stay within that cell or we will shoot you when you try to climb the fence, right? It, that's not to condemn it. I'm just want to describe the criminal justice system operates by violence. That's how it functions actual or threatened violence. So that raises a profound question for us as Christian, which is, what authority do I have to use physical violence against another human? The answer to that from Scripture is that all authority is God's, and I have only that authority delegated. And so it's not enough to say, well, that person had been resisting, and if they hadn't been resisting, the police officer wouldn't do X. As a Christian, you have to back up and say, what authority did the police officer have to do X? I don't mean what legal authority. I mean what moral authority did they have? I mean, there's lots of discussion in Christian ethical thinking and ethical teaching about when it is moral to use physical force, whether by the state or as an act of self-defense. And, um, and, and this would be sort of analogous to the self-defense of the officer protecting himself. And the the ethic, criminal, ethic, criminal uh, Christian ethical teaching is very clear that deadly force must be used only as a last resort. Christian ethical teaching is not unclear about this. Stand your ground laws, for example, are immoral. I don't care how much you like them. You may be offended by that tonight. They are immoral because valuing human life uh, raises means we... we value even the Samaritan. And, and that means that we exercise only that authority that God has delegated to us. And God has delegated to me the authority to use physical violence against other, deadly force against other people only as a last resort. So in those circumstances, you as a Christian, you have to ans ask the question, was that physical violence even if that person resisted wrongly, was that physical, was that deadly violence used as a last resort? Because if it was not, it was not Christian. That's good, Matt. <laughs> when one party promotes harsh or hasty justice and the other the abdication of justice, how do Christians work towards change through the political system? Well, I am not a political scientist or a criminologist. Um, you know, the, these, I, 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 I don't say that lightly. I, what I've tried to do in writing on this topic is stay in the lane that I have expertise on. 
Um, you know, should we vote as Christians taking into account what we believe justice means? Yes. But the particulars of then sort of what policy we should adopt to combat a particular evil in the system is something that Christians of good faith who share my commitment to justice, who share my commitment to Christian ethics, who share my understanding of the Bible, it's something on which they could disagree. And so one thing I've really tried to stay away from in my book is saying, so that means the Christian must do X with this particular policy. I do feel like I can stand in front of you and on the authority of of God's word say that you have an obligation to love the criminally accused and that you have an obligation to design and implement criminal justice policies that seek and will the good of, the, of all participants in this stuff. But I don't think I can stand in front of you and, and compel you and say God demands that you do this particular uh, policy, pers- you, know, you adopt this particular policy to achieve that end. Christians can disagree about that. Those are matters of prudence and wisdom. And so I've really tried to, while I have my views on particular issues, hot button criminal issues, I don't, I've, I've tried to avoid saying this is the only Christian way to respond to that. There are a lot of reasons why his book is good, but it, his care to not bind the conscience unnecessarily is near the top of the list. Y'all, this book is fantastic. You offered one uh, recommendation in regards to voting in the book that I felt especially smote by, which was you asked the question, who's your DA? Right. Does yeah. your district attorney have, you know, violations on their record? Yeah. Are you, I, I don't know. Right. I've never thought about it. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think the most compelling, I mean, I could, this, this is a longer riff and you'll have to read it in my book. So you'll have to just trust my shortened version of it or wait to read the book and conclude I'm right or wrong. But we, there's a concept in, in moral theory called pro, uh, moral proximity. The, 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 the idea is I have a greater moral obligation to intervene uh, in the lives of those who are more morally proximate to me than others. So just to take a simple example, my obligation to my wife is greater than my obligation to Isaac. My obligation to my kids is greater than my obligation to your kids. My obligation to your kids is greater than my obligation to kids halfway around the world. Uh, because, because I'm a finite person, and so my ability to intervene uh, in situations is different, and so that drives my moral obligation. And I, have, I am morally proximate to the criminal justice system in a democracy in a way I am not in a, in a monarchy. I have more responsibility for what the government leaders do in a democracy than I am in a non-democratic system. Uh, I have, because I have the ability, I have a relationship with them that creates obligation. And so I think that means, among other things, that there's a moral obligation to vote uh, because I am responsible for what those folks are doing, which means, among other things, I'm morally responsible to empower the good and restrain the evil ones who are acting on my behalf. But that requires that I know who they are. I mean, Lots of, lots of politicians we can't vote for on a single issue. We're necessarily faced with an array of issues that that politician is going to deal with, and I've got to weigh competing issues. But your district attorney is a one-issue vote. What do they think about criminal justice? And are we going to vote again for the DA who six times had convictions reversed for, for striking jurors on the basis of race? Or are we going to recognize I have a moral obligation to hold that prosecutor accountable, which requires just that I even know who they are and then requires that I show up? Does the machinery of the criminal justice system make it easier to walk past people in ditches? What can we do about that? A- of course it does, because, because I don't even have to see them, right? At least the priest and the Levite had to, like, take affirmative steps to avoid getting a close-up view of the man lying in the ditch. I, can, I don't even have to avert my eyes to avoid looking at what the criminal justice system does to other people. Right? I don't even have to avert my eyes. It all happens behind, behind big wooden doors and Roman columns somewhere downtown. I don't even have to drive around it. I can, I can drive by it without even, without even paying any attention. It all happens invisible to me if I want it to, with no effort. In fact, it will happen invisible to me 
unless I actually cross the street and look in the ditch. And that's part of what I'm trying to do in the book is force people to cross the street and look in the ditch. That's really good. How does and how should the criminal justice system understand and assess repentance? So I think that that's the point that a system should be striving for. This is a larger discussion about sentencing, but we used to have what was called indeterminate sentencing, which meant a judge would sentence you to five to 15 years, and there would be a parole board who was genuinely trying to determine, has there been meaningful change in this person's life? And if there was, then five years would be enough. And if not, then the person might have to say seven or nine or 12 or 15. But in the late 1970s into the early 80s, there became a movement called Truth and Sentencing, which was, we're not gonna sentence people to five to 15 and then them, then them only serve five. We're gonna give them a sentence and they're gonna serve that sentence. And we don't care how much they reformed. We don't care how much they repented. You do the crime, you're gonna do the time. And, and that, that became the dominant mindset. It is still the dominant mindset, but that system lacks forward-looking proportionality. That system looks back and says, this is what that person deserves. But it doesn't look forward and say, but does what it, is what it deserves actually what it takes? In other words, we can look back and say, this person deserves to lose an eye because they took an eye. But the goal of criminal justice is not to take eyes. The goal of criminal justice is to bring people back, right? It's to bring them back. It's to welcome them home. It's to be the father who runs out and says, welcome home. And when we say, you're going to get the sense and we don't care if you repent, what we're saying is we don't want you back. Instead of saying, we want you to repent. We want to save your soul. That's really good, man. Is the death penalty ever just? Yes. You need me to elaborate on that? Well, I just, I know the answer you gave in your book. Yeah, so, so the death penalty is the single biggest moral issue on which I've changed my mind as an adult. I believe that the, in theory, the death penalty is permitted by scripture. In other words, it is not categorically immoral to administer the death penalty. When I was a younger adult, if you had asked me, I would have been like, Genesis 9, 6, he who sheds man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. Next topic. And what I would encourage you to do, if that's your view, is to do what I have done in the years since, which is keep reading. Because there's more in the Bible about the death penalty than Genesis 9, 6. There's an obligation to accuracy. Uh, there is an obligation to impartiality. And since, since the death penalty was reinstated in the United States in the mid-1970s, uh, there have been 184 people who have been sentenced to death who were innocent. Not, no, I'm, not, I'm not talking about people who got their convictions reversed because of legal technicalities. I'm talking about people who were sentenced to death, who did not do it. Many of whom spent decades in prison before they were exonerated. On average, it takes 15 years for someone who was wrongly sentenced to death to be exonerated. 184 people, 2%, one out of every 50 people sentenced to death in the United States is innocent. I'm not talking about actually ultimately uh, executed. I'm talking about of the, of the around 8,000 death sentences handed down since the mid-1970s, 184, about 2%, a little over 2% were innocent. And given that we know it takes about 15 years for an exoneration, statistical modeling done in a study published by the National Academy of Sciences estimates that about 4% of people sentenced to death are innocent. So one out of every 25. And so I just ask, would you send your kid into a room where one out of 50 or one out of 25 people would be shot? And if not, why are we sending someone else's kids in? What has been your experience of Christians in the court system? Underrepresented, average, or overrepresented? And do you think more Christians would help the process? You mean how many Christians participate as police or prosecutors? Is I'm that assuming the that's what they mean. Yeah. So I, I've known over the years many people who would be professing Christians. My brother is a police detective, has been a police detective for more than 20 years in Tampa, Florida. Uh, my uncle was, uh, rose to be the third highest person in the New Jersey State Troopers. You know, I have, I know in my family, I was a federal prosecutor for nine years. I knew fellow federal prosecutors when I was a federal prosecutor in my office who were Christians. So I've known uh, many people who were Christians and who shared uh, my concern probably in some instances uh, evident, you know, displayed it better than I did. 
as, as in their role uh, as prosecutors or police officers or otherwise. Is there one issue in the criminal justice system that you feel American Christians are especially silent on or responding incorrectly to? I would say that I don't think people appreciate that somewhere around 97% of cases are resolved through plea bargaining. And I don't think, in other words, there's no TV show about plea bargaining, right? It's always trials. I can guarantee you a TV show about plea bargaining would not make it past the pilot episode. The tr the, so people, I tend to, I think, because they see TV, they see Tom Cruise and A Few Good Men, or they see Law and Order, they think the criminal justice system is about trials. And the criminal justice system is about plea bargaining. Somewhere between 94 and 97 percent of cases every year are resolved through guilty pleas. And I think people do not understand. And I say, this is my regular line about plea bargaining. I don't care what your politics, you should hate plea bargaining in America. You should hate plea bargaining in America. Plea bargaining operates on injustice. That's the only way it functions. Because you have two constitutional provisions that guarantee you the right to a jury trial. It's in there twice. So how do we, why is everybody waving the right to a jury trial and pleading guilty? Is there just like this crisis of conscience among 97% of criminal defendants? Or are we coercing them or bribing them into pleading guilty? And if you think about it, there's, that is in fact the only way we get people to plead guilty. We either threaten them with a sentence that is unjustly severe, or we induce them with a sentence that is unjustly lenient. So I don't care if you're law and order or bleeding heart, you should hate American style plea bargain. And you have examples of it in the book where it became so disadvantageous for people to go to trial, the risk became so great that it's, that's the calculus, Yeah, right? I mean, we know, we know as a fact scientific fact that people have pled guilty to crimes they did not commit, to murders they did not commit, were sentenced to death having pled guilty to murders they did not commit. And we should pause and ask ourselves, what's going on with the system where people think, I'm better off pleading guilty to a murder I didn't commit than going through the system that they're offering me? Uh, Matt's going to close us in prayer. Before he does, he has something he wants to say. So I never set out to write a book. I never set out to be an activist. But writing this book made me spend the better part of two years thinking about this question that I would commend to you. I spent all my free time virtually reading and thinking about this question. What does it mean to love my neighbor as myself? Recently, Matthew West had a song that just hits me because of that. I've read the words in red, he sings, how you left the 99. To find the one missing feels like that was written with me on your mind. And the prodigal son he ran, leaving his home behind. The part where the father comes running to meet him. Did you say that with me on your mind? I pray that we would be people who would, like the father who ran for us, run to other people who need him. Let's close in prayer. Father, as people made in the image of God, we have a responsibility to be the images of God, to reflect your character, reflect your justice, reflect your love, and we confess that we fall short that we ask who is our neighbor, that we want to shrink the neighborhood of obligation, that we want to love the cul-de-sac but not down the street. Lord, I pray that as people who you have come run to, running to meet, that we would be people who go running to meet. Those who need you, who need to know about your love, who need to know about your justice. And may we do that all in hope that you will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. May we hope that your kingdom will have no end. We pray this in the name of the only just judge, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Before we close this episode, I wanted to make you aware of a special opportunity we have. United We Pray has just received a $50,000 grant to match all donations through year end. So from now to year end, if you give to United We Pray, your gift will be doubled thanks to this matching grant. For more information about this, to donate to United We Pray, or to get more information about the ministry, please visit our website at uwepray.org. Grace and peace.